Adam este șeful unei școli de tehnicieni medical de urgență, echivalentul ambulanțierilor, care după ce ne-a cunoscut și ne-a studiat și a venit aici într-o vizită de documentare, a început ca în fiecare an să știmea de elevii la un curs de trei săptămâni în România. Gărțile de fac pe ambulanțele serviciului de ambulanță din București, o parte și o parte în cadrul unității de primire urgență de, lângă, de pe lângă Spitalul Universitar de București. Pe lângă faptul că ne cunoaștem foarte bine, l-am rugat pe Adam să facă o prezentare Iar el și-a ales ca temă importanța implementării antrenamentelor în planificarea răspunsului la dezastru. Adam, we are all yours. Thank you, Christian. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you that are listening, for those of you that are listening via our translation service, uh, I do apologise. everybody. My name is Adam Barrett. Um, for those of you that are listening via the intercom system um, through our wonderful translator in the box over there, um, I do like to make some slight humorous jokes. So if they're not funny via the translator, uh, that's not my fault, it's her fault. They're funny in English, okay? Okay, um, my name is Adam Barrett. And I am from Northeast Rescue Medical Services. And I've lost my slide. Excuse me. Okay, I'm a remote paramedic from UK. Um, most of my history and background has been via a hostile environment, uh, which has taken me to some of the most uh, austere environments in the world. I'm here today to talk to you about um, an idea. I'm not the greatest doctor in the world, in fact I'm not even a doctor, I'm a, a paramedic, so I'm at quite a basic level uh, to be invited to speak at a conference such as this. Um, but I'm the why guy. Whenever the, someone teaches me something or I learn something new, I always like to find out why we do what we do. So. A little bit about my background in depth then. This is pretty much where my mum thinks I work. Um, she thinks I sit on top of a beautiful mountain range, um, in nice, safe environments, um, looking after a few people that go into the mountain ranges. As I've said, the, the reality of this is usually quite different. My background is usually in places such as Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and more recently Libya. Um, so, working in this environment gives you a bit more of a unique perspective. As I said, I'm the why guy. I like to ask why things are done in a certain way. And the one thing that working in these kind of environments taught me is you don't have all the resources that you would normally have when back in your home country. So you pretty much live life in a rucksack. So when I was looking at the problem of national resilience recently, um, as a bit of a study topic, uh, I don't read Harry Potter, these, these are my study topics. Um, I was looking at the, the way that we deal with um, post-incident or post-disasters the way we sort of generate our emergency response from that. And the one thing that I did come across is the first thing that pretty much every country does at ground zero, at the point where the incident occurs, the first step that we always take is to exclude everyone. We stop anybody that's a well-wisher, that wants to help, that wants to do good, 
and we put up a big cordon and we stop them from coming in. We do this for a really good reason. We do this to make sure that they don't become a casualty themselves because it's a very dangerous environment. We also do it so we can control the people that are going into that environment so we, they, they don't then become a hindrance. Now, I also get inspiration from other fields and other experts in different arenas. And one expert that I did find that I like uh, very much some of his work, one expert I did come across was Captain Jack Sparrow. Now, he thinks a little bit like me, and he drinks a little bit more, not much more, but a little bit more. And he said, the problem is not the problem, the problem is the way that you're thinking about the problem, your attitude towards the problem. So, instead of just taking an off-the-shelf solution, instead of looking at what America does, or looking at what UK does, or what other countries do, what I'd urge you to do is to try and look at it from a Romanian perspective. <coughs> look at your Romanian problem and come up with a Romanian solution. And if that doesn't match the rest of the world's idea of that solution, then that's kind of a cool thing. It's nothing to be ashamed of. So, I'm going to give you a little test now about your perception, the way you see things. The monkey business solution. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Now you need to focus carefully for this. Who spotted the gorilla? Oh, well done. I haven't seen or heard about a video like this before. About half missed the gorilla. Where did that grow? If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color for the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Now, all the smart people that spotted the gorilla aren't feeling so smart because they didn't notice the curtains getting changed. And there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. Now, you might be wondering as to the context of that video, but. I do that because of your perspective when it comes to problem solving. When you're looking at national resilience, when you're looking at ideas to solve your problems, don't be pigeonholed into one sort of avenue and for looking for answers. Think wider, think broader, and try and spot the gorilla and the colour changes. So, coming back onto topic then, what is, uh, what is the ability to implement training at sort of the ground zero, at the disaster occurrence. Why is that so important? Um, here's just three reasons I came up with. The bottom line is no one has a ready supply of trained personnel. We can never be completely prepared for every emergency. Um, if you're looking for case examples of proving this point, just look towards 9-11, the 7-7 bombings in London. Things like this that have tested national resilience strategies and found holes. Weaknesses were found and were identified. Okay, We can never be completely prepared. But volunteers, these people that we exclude and put on the other side of the cordon, these people can then become trainees. And trainees are useful. Probably the one person in this room that knows the power of a volunteer is sat at that desk right there. Yeah? It's an integral part of this country's emergency response. It also, if you have lost part of your infrastructure in the national disaster, the volunteers then become an integral part of re-establishing the infrastructure. 
after the uh, event has occurred. So I have a plan. And just because it's my plan doesn't mean it needs to be your plan. But you can ask the same kind of questions. So my plan is, why don't we find a clicker that works? Got it now. Um, why don't we enable these volunteers to help from day one? From the point of when the disaster occurs, let's get these people involved. Yeah, let's make them useful. Some of the problems that we're going to face, we are going to hit some issues. In the first 24 hours of a disaster, we must allocate our resources to the emergency. It's a, an absolute no-brainer. We must allocate all of our resources to the emergency. People are in grave danger and in grave need. <coughs> and teaching uses some of that valuable time and some of those resources. So we can't take people to one side, put them in a classroom and say, here you go guys, I'm going to sit here with a PowerPoint and I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know about dealing with an emergency. But overcoming some of those problems then, as I've said, we must still allocate all of our resources to the emergency, but if we prepare ground zero mentors now, so before the disaster occurs, if we prepare our doctors, our nurses, our emergency response teams, our current volunteers, if we prepare them for the ability to take on board a member of the public as a, uh, as a helper, and prepare them to teach them and coach them and keep them safe, that is a resource, a resource builder. Yeah? From the organisational side, job for you sir, from the organisational side, if we secure some basic personal protective equipment for these volunteers, then we can have safely equipped and monitored people working in the disaster zone. So, in order to put a little bit of an idea of how this would work out over the timeline of a disaster, let's look at an average disaster timeline. Now, the line in green is that of a trained responder, one solo responder, so that's one doctor on the scene. And the blue line is the doctor that's taken a member of the public and is coaching them straight away. So, at zero hour, at the point where the emergency team is deployed, that doctor then will work tirelessly, usually for around about 24 hours before exhaustion kicks in. At that point, the doctor needs to, is forced to, actually get some sleep, which is usually about two to three hours. During that time, the doctor has been extremely productive, he's saved many, many lives, and now he's gone to sleep, and he wakes up after about two hours rest, he maybe grabs a little bite to eat, and then he goes back to work. But as his energy levels are declining over time in the next 24 hours, so are the survivability rates of the people that are trapped and injured. So this timeline always declines, there's no escape in that. And certainly as we creep towards a 72 hour mark, the chances of actually getting people alive out of rubble piles or other emergency situations dwindles away quite significantly. And at the 72 hour onward point, we're literally looking for the golden egg in the rubble pile. Yeah, we're looking for the one life. If you compare that now to the blue line, which is the doctor that took a volunteer with them. Now initially the doctor was perhaps slightly hindered by the fact that he had to go to the collection point, collect a volunteer, give him a little bit of instruction as to how to keep safe, and tell him not to touch anything in his bag, usually. Um, what happens at about two hours in, is the performance of that team, those two people together now, is twice as effective at saving lives than the solo responder. So you can see straight away that it is a resource builder. Now the same thing is going to happen at 24 hours. They're both going to be exhausted, they're both going to need to take some sleep, and they're both going to need some food. Yeah? But the interesting thing is when they come back, the timeline, the productivity of this timeline is still higher than it would have been had it have just been one responder. So, 
Moving on then, in summary, just to sort of recap what we've talked about, you can never be prepared for every eventuality. It's impossible. But preparing to be resourceful as a nation is something that you can do, that you can factor into your response plans. And mentorship at ground zero is not a burn of resources. In fact, it's a resource builder. You can increase productivity exponentially by taking on these mentors. Thanks very much for your time. Um, if anybody's got any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Well, Adam, me, I can say I'm very curious. How is the law in your country? Pardon? How is the law in your country in this respect? The law. Do you have some uh, specific regulation related to the mentorship? Yeah, there's, there's always going to be problems to overcome in regard to um, insurance and health and safety. Um, the one thing I will say about this, it would need to be implemented at the highest possible level. It's not something that could just be implemented regionally or in a district, for example. This would need to be something that the complete nation agrees on and that the, the red tape, so to speak, and the correct policies and procedures are put in place and followed. So there is a lot of work behind this idea. Um, if it was simple, everybody would do it. But um, the one thing that I would add on to this as well is if you exclude all of the people in an emergency, from an emotional standpoint, there's a lot of healing after these incidents. And for, certainly for someone that's worked in these post-incident areas, um, seeing the emotional problems that the communities have afterwards is uh, substantial. But if you have communities that work together and serve to solve the problem together, then that also forms part of the healing process. So, are the professional allowed to take volunteer with them in the zero zones? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure it would be allowed. Um, certainly we have mentorship programs, but in that kind of an environment, I'm not certain that the UK would go with it. Um, my idea is just to challenge the status quo, to see if I can shake some things up and hopefully make some people take notice. Um, the bottom line is, people die in the first 24 hours that could have been saved if we'd have just had a few extra guys, or girls. Sorry, I'm not saying. <laughs> you know, in our experience, when we have a red code alarm last year, in 45 minutes we, we have about uh, 50 people in place. That means the equal number with the nurses that are in a shift in the ambulance of the Paris community. Practically, we can double our number in one hour. In your country, it's a system that similar with that. Yeah, um, the, there is voluntary societies that do work in accordance with the emergency, like the National Emergency Response Plans. Um, we have people like International Red Cross, um, St John's Ambulance, uh, International Rescue Corps. There's quite a few organisations that actually pull together. Um, you also have local voluntary uh, groups such as Mountain Rescue Organisations uh, and Charity Run Organisations as well, which feed into the National Resilience Strategy. So there is. There is a mechanism there for allowing volunteers to come in, but obviously there is a pre-recognition of skill for those volunteers that come forward. Whereas my idea is not everybody that turns up at the cordon is useless, and maybe they could be used for not exactly always the rescue effort, but maybe they could be fulfilling other roles, such as sorting out camp beds making sure that people are fully hydrated, 
uh, for the rescue teams. So there are support networks that these volunteers could be useful. Uh, uh, may I ask a question? Uh, um, I I wanted to ask, do you really think that there is like a really big gap between the um, training of the paramedics from Romania and the ones from New Zealand, Great Britain, Austria and so on? Do you believe that our paramedics are under-trained mainly because they do not really, uh, they don't really do this job as a main uh, profession, they're firefighters? Okay, um, in, in regards to uh, scope of practice, uh, a UK paramedic is a completely different scope of practice to that of a Romanian paramedic. Um, for example, most UK paramedics will ca carry things like ALS drugs and will have um, significant sort of a scope of practice in regard to that. Um, but on the other side of things, the interesting thing that's happening in the UK right now is the fire services are starting to roll out fire service ambulances. Now this is generally for a low level response, um, but there is definitely appears to be a move towards joining up of emergency services in the UK. Yeah, but still, how do you find the fact that there are assigned cases that are mainly um, uh, that the ambulance services or the nurse are being called for? I mean, they are trying to do the nurses' jobs uh, when they're not supposed to, I suppose. Do you believe that is true? Um, I can't, couldn't really comment on that. I mean, obviously, the, the time that I've worked in Romania has been working with the doctors on the front line. Unfortunately, I've never actually worked with the, the paramedic response, so I couldn't really comment on, on what kind of cases that you attend. Okay, well, let me make it a little bit more, more clear on this at the end. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, do you think the paramedics should have more medical rights as the nurses in this country? Or more than doctors in some cases? Okay, that depends on how many jobs that you believe you can do to the highest scope of practice. Um, for example, there's, uh, there's a reason why you, a carpenter is a different person to an electrician, and an electrician is a different person to a plumber. It's because they're specialists at what they do. So if you have one person that does all trades, something's got to give. Unless that person's a robot, in my opinion, you cannot be an expert in all professions. Yeah, I, I never meant to say that the, the paramedics from me are not trained, they're highly trained professionals. They really are. But um, I only ask if you think that there should be some distinct line between what the ambulance does, like the ambulance, and the others do, like from the firefighter divisions. Yeah, there should be a clear divide, in my opinion. That was, uh, that was the main question. I Sorry. Just <laughs> it's alright. Thank you very much. So there, there, there still exists this red tape. Um, my idea is literally just that. It's just an idea. It's not an example of what a, a country does. It's just a thought-provoking challenge. Um, in regard to can, could it work, I can tell you emphatically it can work. Um, one of the reasons I started looking into this subject was my time spent in Libya um, post Gaddafi. And straight away, there became, it became very apparent to me that they had an awful lot of resources, but no one to staff them. So, for example, there were lots and lots of 
international aid charities and there were lots of parked up ambulances in ambulance stations which were perfectly serviceable but no one to actually use them. So my idea was to give some people some basic training and actually try and roll out those ambulances and that was primarily done with a volunteer um, sort of organisation um, which worked quite well. Unfortunately the country then destabilised so it wasn't allowed to continue um, as we had to leave the country but it's an example of how it could work. Are cineva vreo întrebare? Thank you, Adam. Thank, Thank you very much. And uh, we are waiting for you in the middle. Da, eu cred că ceea ce ne-a transmis Adam este un lucru interesant. <coughs> Fiecare persoană care a urmat un training specific poate să apeleze la un voluntar neantrenat în domeniul respectiv, într-un caz de dezastru, într-un caz de situație foarte gravă. Și atunci, în felul acesta, eficiența acestui grup este mai mare decât dacă expertul ar lucrat sunt convins și eu de lucrul ăsta și sunt sigur că la momentul la care se va invi o asemenea nevoie, toate cele peste 4.000 de persoane care au semnat contract de voluntariat într-o formă sau alta în București cu societatea de salvare, vor fi disponibile. Iar dintre ei, cei antrenați, vor putea să-și folosească mai bine abilitățile create prin antrenament, ajutându-se cu cei care sunt mai puțin antrenați sau deloc, dar sunt voluntari, ca spirit, ca suflet, ca disponibilitate. Cred că este o idee valoroasă ce spune Adam și ar trebui să ne gândim serios la lucrul ăsta și poate să creăm un cadru necesar pentru dezvoltarea unor astfel de idei. 